Hi, welcome to WetPixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WetPixel, and this episode is sponsored by Salaya Beach Houses, um, based in Dumaguete in the Philippines. Um, it's a wonderful place for black sand macro um, and a great place to visit. Um, obviously, Dumaguete has some wonderful macro critters and a great place to shoot. Um, <laughs> the um, website address is Salaya, that's S A L A Y A dot com. So head on over and check them out. Um, I'm joined by my regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, hey, Adam. Nice to see you. Um, so um, one of the things that people often find difficult is obviously they produce an image, they import it to a computer, um, and then they come to export it and to put it online to Facebook, social media, wherever it is it's going, and the colours have gone weird. So um, I thought perhaps I'd ask Alex about how he deals with colours when he's sharing images. What, what do you do, Alex? Okay, well, um, the usual cause of that specific problem is is a colour space mm. issue. And mm. um, it's not the most exciting topic, um, but it is an important one. An important and one, I have yeah. to say that mm. I'm not a expert on these things. Our friend Erin, yeah. I'm sure we'll give her a plug um, at the end of this, um, it is much more of a, a, a resource to really understand these things. Yeah. However, you know, working as a professional photographer, these are things that I deal with all day, every day. Yep. And although I may not have the detailed technical knowledge, I certainly have a lot of practical knowledge and practical experience. So perhaps my slightly dumbed down explanation is actually yeah. quite helpful to people yeah. um, rather than actually understanding everything about it. Yeah. So the first thing to consider is that when we look at our pictures normally on a computer, they're in an RGB color space, red, green, blue color space or colors. And there are different flavors of that. Yep. And there's kind of two that we need to worry about the most. Um, one is called sRGB and the other one is called Adobe RGB. There are more and more of them um, than that, but I think I will keep this conversation to those two. Um, most people are processing their pictures in Adobe RGB because Adobe RGB has a nicer range of colors, shall we say. Yep. It's yep. maybe a slightly bigger cut pencil case of coloring pencils. Yeah. Um, then then more crayons. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. More crayons um, in there. Um, however, computer screens, web browsers, phone screens, they like sRGB as a yep. color space. So the typical procedure is that if you're working in your picture in Lightroom, you want to work on it in Adobe RGB. So you have the best colors available to you to make the picture look as, as great as you can. When you then want to share that picture, um, out social media, um, when you want to put it on your website, just like I do, um, I will export that as sRGB color space. Yep. So underneath the export menu in both Lightroom and in Photoshop, sure. yeah. um, if you go in there, there, there's a thing that says color space and you either click the sRGB box or it's on Photoshop, it's convert to sRGB. Yep. And that then allows you to see it, the computer then converts your Adobe RGB into sRGB. And for some pictures, it'll look absolutely identical. For other pictures, it might just look slightly different. Yep. Um, and that's really because you're dealing, you're basically having to change from one pencil case to another pencil case. That's kind of got most of the same colors the same, but a few areas um, are not quite the same. And the area that often trips things up, is particularly, is the blues. blues. But it can be be, be, be other areas as well. Yep. Um, if it's a really massive change for you, you might want to, um, make that conversion earlier in the process, particularly in Photoshop, and tweak the colors up so you don't have to do the set, the process at the end. But most of the time, there'll only be one person in the whole world who's aware that your picture isn't looking quite right, and that's you. Yeah. Um, the important thing, though, is to do that conversion. If you share a an Adobe RGB picture, um, generally online it will look washed out and flat. Yeah. Now, a lot of the web browsers nowadays can actually read Adobe RGB, but I have no idea whether the the Facebook app on my phone can read Adobe RGB. I've never tried. So and, and it's important to save it into the sRGB to have a consistency of look across lots of devices. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a little bit more technical because the um the, the range of the, the number of crayons in the box we call a gamut. And the more the more the more crayons, the the higher gamut, the less crayons, obviously the, the least gamut. Um and that I'm going to introduce the third color space, which um, is called Pro Photo RGB. And 
what confuses a lot of people is this is the default color space that Lightroom uses. So when you import an image into Lightroom, whether it's a raw file or whatever, Lightroom generates a JPEG version that you can view on the screen. And that JPEG version is will be in ProPhoto RGB. Now, I have to say, most monitors can't actually see the full gamut of ProPhoto RGB. So, so to some extent, this is not a difference that you will even see um, with your eyes. There are a few monitors that, that have more color gamuts available. The majority of them can't. So the problem comes in then when you start editing in ProPhoto and then um, you start switching your, your, your color spaces around, you can get some pretty weird results. Now, I have to say with myself, I mean, yes, I, I, I do it within Lightroom. I leave it in ProPhoto. Um, I tend to export into, into, into Photoshop in, in ProPhoto RGB. But at, at some point, I've got to convert it to sRGB. And, and my, I'll go through the whole process. I'll press export. And if it doesn't look right, I go, OK, I need to go back in and re-edit the colors on this and figure out what to do with it. Um, I don't have any great science as to how to convert from one to the other. And possibly there may be people out there who can say, well, do this, do that. But I can't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's more a question of, of trial and error um, and, and trying things out and seeing how it looks. Um, but but I, I would say the number of pictures that there's an issue with is very small. Yeah. Um, and I think most of the time in terms of showing stuff online, you know, I, I would just accept the small difference because you're, you're basically going to spend hour you know you're gonna get yeah. all het up about this small change and yeah. then you know email it to your other half and look at it on their phone it'll look completely different again so yeah. you know i get over <laughs> yourself a little bit on on yeah, that yeah. um yeah, it's yeah. worth understanding the the role of the other color spaces in that the, the if you want to send your pictures to magazines yeah. the color space that they will want the pictures in for printing is um or as an input is usually adobe rgb and yeah. that's the standard space in which pictures are shared by photo libraries that photographers send pictures to clients that sort of thing and the, that's because you've got slightly more detail in that the the, the um so that's going to use however the situation gets more complicated when those magazines and books and things want to print those pictures mm -hmm. Because then they need to change the colors into a completely different type of crayons, um, completely, <laughs> which is called CMYK color. Yeah. And the difference between sRGB and Adobe RGB and and and, and Pro RGB is very small. The yep. difference between RGB and CMYK is big, yep. and CMYK has, compared to RGB, has lots of areas where it doesn't have the right crayons for, and particularly. In, in blues and yellows are, are big problem areas. And as underwater photographers, we have big problems with blues. You may well have seen photos printed in magazines, underwater photos, where the sea looks purple or where the sea looks gray, where it should mm. be blue. Mm. And that's because the photographer tweaked their blues around in, in Photoshop, in Lightroom, to get them looking the way they want to. And they pushed them outside of what would ever be a realistic amount in, in CMYK. And as a result, that color is just not in CMYK and you end up with a really big blue shift. Yeah. Um, and that could be a problem with printing. Um, yeah. You can do a few things to, 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 to negotiate against that. But generally, as working photographers, you tend to leave that side of things to the publishers. Yeah. Um, you tend to not overprocess your files, not push things around endlessly. And it's particularly a problem is, is that if you really push stuff around away from how it was when you shot it, what yep. you're doing is you're squeezing the colors into a narrower and narrower range. Yep. And then if that range isn't well represented, you have big problems. Yep. Whereas if you don't push your colors around in processing and you give them to the magazine, there's a whole range in that blue. It's yep. not just you know a solid color of one particular hue. It's got a nice range within that hue and it'll tend to convert a bit more reliably. Um, so yeah, don't push things around. The other thing that the CMYK conversion tends to do is it tends to make the picture heavier. And yep. so if you've got your colors saturated up, you've got kind of a dark contrasty picture that looks great on your computer yeah, yeah. screen on a magazine, that will just be too much ink going on the page and all the detail will just be obliterated under this kind of mat of, of, of wet paper. 
I always yep. feel, you know, as a photographer, you kind of feel, oh, if I send that to a magazine, it's just going <laughs> to all go black and the, the magazine's going to arrive and at the person's house and they're going to open it and the paper's <laughs> still going to be dripping wet because I've just oversaturated it so much. And just over time, you get sensitive towards these things. So yep. you don't want your pictures to be too heavy in contrast. You don't want them to be too saturated. You don't want the colours to be too pushed around. And then the CMYK conversions tend to take care of themselves pretty well. Um, but that's a whole other area. I just thought I'd mention it because I know it's something as people expand their photography knowledge that they want to dive into a bit more. And I think this is a, this is very relevant as well, not just in, in sort of magazine. But if you know, if you are getting your pictures printed by print houses, um, you know, generally the print houses are pretty good at dealing with this. Um, but a lot of them have very limited experience of the of underwater photography and what makes underwater photography work. This is why it's worth working with a you know a print house that knows what they're doing. Um, you know, there are a few around the place that can actually specifically help you to get the best results with prints. Obviously, particularly printing on metal, these types of subjects, you know, that those kinds of, uh, of sort of material, um, they require a certain amount of specialist knowledge in order to do it right. Um, so, you know, getting getting a good print house will certainly make a difference. And they, they can help you as well with your color color um your your color spectrum selection as well so yeah the important thing in all of this and i don't really want to get bogged down in cmyk i just mentioned it because it was part of this whole discussion is mm. that when you save your pictures you need to embed the color space in them underneath mm. save as options in all of these um mm. if there is a choice always embed your color space otherwise your picture arrives at another computer it gets opened up by the software and if the yep. software doesn't know what the color space is it has to guess yep. and it might guess wrong Yep. Um, whereas if it knows what the color space is, it should come up on the other person's computer looking just like yours. And that's why when you put stuff on the web, you convert it to sRGB first yep. so that that's the expected, so that it's the expected because a lot of that software isn't looking to try and read color space. Yep. So you, you're therefore giving it what it's expecting. And that's why we make that conversion. But yep. sRGB is the easiest for all devices to show us, yep. but it's the it's not necessarily got the most detail in. And so possibly as a final point, competition entries, um, most of the time competitions want to have the possibility of printing images. Um, and so they will normally want a, uh, a higher gamut color space, most commonly, again, Adobe RGB. But it's very, very important that you look on the submission guidelines for the respective competition that you're entering and you enter in whatever the required color space is, because the judges will be looking on their on their browsers in whatever color space it is and obviously yeah. that does make a difference particularly when you're comparing images and um, you know if, if someone hasn't got the color space quite right and the colors a bit more washed out that can make a big difference in a competition entry and um, so it's really really important that you get your color spaces right for, for competition entries i think yeah I, I would say that the majority of competitions these days are judged in software like lightroom or photo mechanic you know and, and those will all read color space Mm. But I completely agree with you. It's, you know, use the color space that you're told to use. Mm. Otherwise, you know, if you, there's really, you know, you, you know, you're not going to likely to do very well because your pictures may well look wrong. Um, don't try and be clever with these things. Do exactly what you're told. I completely yeah, okay. agree. But make sure you embed that that color space in your picture. I think the practical element of doing so, particularly within Lightroom or Photoshop, I think the best place to go as a resource for, for finding out how to do that would be to go and visit Erin Quigley's um, channel, um, goaskerin.com. Um, she's got all sorts of info there about Lightroom and Photoshop in general, but also including information about color spaces and how to work in specific color spaces and how to convert images from one color space to another within those those apps. So so I think that's a really good place to probably go for the specific how to, how to do it. Um, that's wonderful. Um, Thank you very much, Alex. Um, great discussion. Um, and um, I'd like to thank Slyer Beach House again for sponsoring this episode. Um, we obviously really appreciate our sponsor support. Please feel free to um, add any comments or suggestions into the suggestions box and drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.